Yes. So good morning. Today we will discuss pre-malignant issues of cervix. Cervical cancer is the, mo the, uh, is the third most frequent cancer in women in all over the world and second in India. It accounts for 6.6% of all female case, female malignant cases and 2.6 lakh death every year. 90% of death occur from low and middle income countries. So there is, uh, so there is high mortality can be reduced by uh, prevention, effective screening, early diagnosis and treatment, uh, treatment programs. Human papillomavirus vaccine can reduce the risk of cervical cancer. So CAN, that is cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, is a pre-malignant condition of the uterine cervix. CAN refers to scamous abnormalities only. Glandular cervical neoplasia includes adenocarcinoma, adenocarcinoma in situ, and adenocarcinoma. Screening for cervical cancer includes cervical cytology testing and oncogenic subtypes of human papillomavirus testing. So abnormalities in screening tests should be followed up with corposcopy and cervical biopsy and which will result in diagnosis of cervical cancer. CIN may be low grade or high grade. Low grade CIN means it is there is a minimal potential for developing into cervical malignancy. High grade lesions means there is at high risk of progress to malignancy. CIN per se is not a malignancy, it is only a pre-malignant condition. So we will discuss regarding anatomy. We, as you all know, it is a tubular, tubular micro muscle, fibromuscular structure. There is a conduit between the endomeral cavity and the vagina. The ectocervix, the surface of the cervix of the ectocervix is, uh, is protrudes into the vagina and is covered by squamous epithelium. Endocervix, the, uh, the cervix canal, it is lined with columnar glandular epithelium. So we will discuss regarding squamous columnar junction. This is a junction of the squamous and the glandular columnar cells generally at the near the external cervical os. So, uh, the, uh, so the transformation zone means the area between the original squamous columnar junction and the present one or the current one. So the transformation zone is an area of squamous metaplasia. It contains cells vulnerable to infection with HPV and on potential for oncogenic transformation. The squamous columnar junction and the transformation zone are areas at greatest risk of neoplasia. So here in this picture, you can see the outer original squamous columnar junction and the inner active or present squamous columnar junction. So during before puberty, the uh, original squamous columnar junction lies inside the endocervical canal. As the as the patient or as the girl um, attains menarche. Uh, there is um, uh, the, two, uh, the cervix will um, evert out and the columnar epithelium will also come outside and it will the squama columnar junction will be lying near the uh, attachment of the vagina in the outer portion that is outer portion of the cervix so um, when women reach the 30s due to the effect of estrogen and the uh, colonization of lactobacilli and the, the pH becomes acidic and the columnar cells which is exposed that which is exposed in the into the vagina will go for squamous metaplasia and they will and they, there is a new the, so the squamous metaplasia and there is there is a new squamous columnar injection form and it is near the uh, that is it is near the os so you can see that the the blue area is the area between the original squamous columnar junction and the new squamous columnar junction that is the transformation zone there is the high there is higher potential for uh, oncogenic uh, transformation in postmenopausal ladies this new squamous columnar junction and the original squamous columnar junction lies inside the endocervical canal 
that is because of the uterus uh, becomes short, the cervix becomes shortens and the, and the, there is a regression of the uh, epithelial cells so uh, depending upon the classification we see regarding classification there historically pre malignant squamous changes of the cervix were described as mild moderate or severe cervical dysplasia it is not used now now we use cn classification and with this system CN is actually a histological classification, a historical classification of the cells, uh, of the tissue available by biopsy or surgery. So CN means it's a mild dysplasia or low-grade lesions. CN2 means moderate dysplasia, high-grade lesions. CN3 means severe dysplasia and high-grade lesions. So CN has three degrees of severity. CN1, it is mildly atypical cell cellular changes in the lower third of the epithelium. CN2 means this high grade lesion refers to moderately atypical cellular changes and confined to the basal two thirds of the epithelium. CN3 is high grade lesion refers to severe atypical cellular changes involving two third or full thickness of the uh, full thickness of the epithelium. So cytology classification is with this system that is we have been commonly used nowadays. It, uh, it, uh, uh, it comes un uh, under this, there is, there is squamous intraepithelial lesions and adenomatous lesions. So, squamous and intraepithelial lesions are classified into LSIL also, or low grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, or HSIL, or high grade squamous intraepithelial lesions. So, the cellular abnormalities are classified as atypical squamous cells. That is, squamous cells, uh, uh, cellular abnormalities of squamous cells are, are classified as atypical squamous cells. Atypical squamous cells are of a two variety of undetermined significance or cannot exclude high-grade uh, squamous intraepithelial lesion, HSIL, uh, and in, uh, that is ASCH. Uh, or uh, atypical squamous cell undetermined significance are ASUS, that is ASCUS. So the second one is low-grade squamous intraepithelation, and the th third one is high-grade squamous intraepithelation and the squamous cell carcinoma. So cell, squamous cell abnormalities can be classified into four. Then comes glandular cells. It, there is one is atypical glandular cells. Where we have to specify whether it is endocervical, endometrial, or otherwise not specified. It's typical glandular cell which, are, which favors neoplasia. So it's, there is features of neoplasia is present. And fourth one is endocervical adenocarcinoma in situ, and uh, third one, and fourth one is adenocarcinoma. The histological classification which belongs to AN1 is equivalent to low grade squamous intraepithelation in Bethesda system. And CAN2 means it is a heterogeneous mixer that includes lesion that could be called as CAN1 or 3. So we have to um, uh, further um, uh, further investigate and we have to stratify according to P16 immunostaining. Staining. So if it is P16 negative, negative, then we will call it as designate it as LSI, this low-grade squamous intraepithelation. Or P16, if it is P16 fall positive, we will designate it as high-grade high squamous intraepithelation. CAN is referred to as HSIL. So you can see the, uh, the uh, classification. In the picture, you can see only the lower one third of the epithelium is having a, uh, uh, that is neoplastic changes, uh, atypical changes. In the second picture, you can see the two third of the epithelial uh, thickness is affected with atypical changes. In the third one, third picture, you can see the, that is third picture, you can see the, uh, that is more, more full thickness of the epithelium is uh, um, replaced by atypical cells. So in the last one, there is a there is carcinoma in situ full of uh, atypical cells. Prevalence of uh, CNs and cervical intraepithelial lesions in the, in the general population. CN1 is around 3 percentage, CN2 is 0.6 percentage, CN3 is 0.4 percentage. The high grade lesions are typically diagnosed with the patient age is 35 to 25 to 35 years. Invasive cancer is com commonly diagnosed at around 40 years. So there is a typically a, a lag of around 8 to 13 years of diagnosing a pre of diagnosing a um, uh, this pre lesion to a full blown cancer. So there is this is the time where we should intervene and we should we should uh, modify the progress of the disease by our screening techniques. So CN will progress to 1% CN progress to progress to invasive malignancy. CN2 5% progress to invasive malignancy. CN3 12% progress to invasive malignancy. See the CN as such may regress or may progress to CN2 or CN3. 
or inversely malignancy. CIN2 and 3 not necessarily preceded, preceded by preceded by CIN1. So we will discuss the etiology. The most, the most common etiologies or major etiologies, human papilloma virus infection. The two major factors associated development of grade one, grade, uh, uh, severe grade CIN and the cervical cancer are the subtype of human papilloma virus and the persistence of the virus. So, so they are associated with, both are associated with, uh, associated with uh, squamous and adenocarcinoma. HPV or human papillomavirus is circular double stranded DNA virus with a protein capsule. It is a member of the papovoviridae family. It infects human squamous or metaplastic epithelial cells. Almost 130 types are uh, we have detected. And transmission is via contact with the infected membrane and bodily, or body fluids. So you can see there are around 40 types which will infect lower genital tract and around that 15 are high, high, high risk group that is 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, 39, 41, 52, 53 and 56. So low risk groups mainly human papilloma 6 and 11. They do not integrate in the host genome, only cause low grade lesions and benign condylomatous genital wards. Account 10% of low grade lesions and percent of um, uh, condylomatous genital wards. 90% of the condylomer genital wards. The high risk human papilloma types include 16, 18, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 58. They are strongly associated with high grade lesions and persistence and progression in invasive cancer. Human papilloma 16, 18 accounts for 25% low grade lesions, 50 to 60% of high grade lesions, and 70% cervical cancers. So, mechanism of carcinogenesis. The papillomavirus infects only the epithelium. Viral access is via the micro microtrauma to transformation zone to the immature basal and the parabasal cells. So HPV affects the cellular growth differentiation through the interaction of viral E6 and E7 proteins with tumor suppressor genes P53, RB genes respectively. So the viral genome is, in, uh, is affecting the um, cell uh, proliferation and differentiation. Hence, there is a malignant transformation. Early sexual activity, multiple sexual partners, and partners with multiple sexual, pa sexual partners are other risk factors. Uh, herpes simplex virus, chlamydia, and gonorrhea also are predisposed to um, spray CIN. Immunosuppression due to human immunodeficiency virus, immunosuppressive therapy, autoimmune disease, and malignancies can also uh, lead to um, uh, CIN. Cigarette smoking, oral contraceptives, and low social media status, multiparity are also predisposing risk factors. So how will we go around about cervical cancer prevention? The, uh, the most important two milers, two cornerstones are primary prevention by vaccination and secondary prevention by screening and treatment of precancer lesion. Because we know, you know that from CIN to uh, full-blown malignancy, there is a time lag of 8 to 13 years. We have to interfere in between. That is the importance of screening te techniques. The screening. Cervical for screening for cervical cancer refers from cancer, other cancer skin because there is a defined, well pre malignant stage of disease which can be easily treated. It is now one of the most successful prevention program. So how will we, how we, how should we go about screening? According to ACOG, and there's a, we, at the age of the patient before uh, before 21 years or less than 21 years, there is no screening is uh, the needed. If the age of the patient, if the age of the girl or woman is around 21 to 29 years, screening every three years with conventional pap smear or liquid-based cytology, and 30 to 30, 65 years, if three previous three consecutive tests in the last 10 years are negative, then you can go for screen every uh, three yearly with pap, pap smear or um, liquid-based cytology, or you should go for every five yearly with core testing, that is HPV DNA plus cytology. So to summarize, that is above uh, uh, after 30 years, we should either do a core testing with core testing with PAP test HPV DNA every five years, or HP primary HPV testing every five years, or better to done in three years, or PAP test with reflex HPV testing every three years, or PAP test alone every three years. That is the this is the group we should concentrate. That is after age after 30 years, they are uh, having high risk for developing HPV infection and uh, CIN. So uh, regarding um, pay, um, person, the, the woman around above 65 years, that is if the three consecutive interest in the last 10 years are negative and there is no history of CIN2 in the last 20 years, then you can discontinue screening. 
then if the post hysterectomized woman if the cervix is removed and the hysterectomy is done for benign indication and there is no history of cain2 in the last 20 years then discontinue discontinue screening so it, status regarding um, human papillomavirus vaccinated women women who have been vaccinated should continue to be screened screening practice should not change on the basis of human papillomavirus vaccination status so what are the methods of screening available the one is cytology well, cytological methods are stun measures pap smear and liquid based cytology H human papillomavirus dna assessment uh, and also visual approach that is vli and vi the pap smear it is introduced we all know this this introduced by pap recall we all do in our routine op as a routine op procedure in our america we all always do the pap smear with the advent of pap smear incidence of pre cervical cancer decreased by 70 percent in developed countries and the sensitivity is uh, 50 percent specificity is high that is around 98 percentage sensitivity is somewhat low compared to specificity the procedure Visualize the cervix is cusco speculum, you uh, clear and then scrape the ecto cervix with IS spatula around 360 degrees uh, and enter cervix with a cytobrush. Smear the cells on the glass slide, fix in a one is to one mixture of 99 percent ethanol and either chain with papnicola stain and examine. This is the picture showing the uh, how you collect a pap smear. This IS spatula, the bifid edge is introduced, the mama introduced into the cervical canal and you, have, you, go, you go for rotation around 30, 360 degrees. Liquid-based cytology, scrape the cells with a spir spiral broom, collect it in a liquid medium, transport to the lab, process, a smear of monolayer cells are made and fixed and blood and other cells are removed. The residual scammel can be used for human papillomavirus testing. So it can be used in co-testing. This is a broom and then um, the cervix canal specimen by, the, by collecting a broom. So conventionally you are using your NGS spatula, it enters cervical brush and then you samples are collected in a complex jar. In the, in the liquid based cytology, we are using a broom and it is samples are collected in a jar containing special preservative solution and it's centrifuged and made a monolayer to, for, to, to, look at any, to look at any abnormalities. So HPV DNA testing, the we are in HPV DNA test, I did most but not all of high risk group HPV types as a very high a negative predictive value, it is around 99%. It is negative, it is important, it is very high negative predictive value. And test, uh, test around 13 high risk human papillomavirus, that is uh, 16, 18, 31, 33, 35, 39, 52, 56, 58, 6, 59, and 68. Due to high prevalence of this temporary of this temporary infection, this, uh, there is no diagnostic value it is done before the 30s because maybe women will be infected with human papillomavirus as they um, uh, ensue sexual activity. So it should be no, should not be done less than 30 years. So reflex human papillomavirus testing. That is a um, uh, pap test is performed. The first uh, first you do a pap test. Then the, if the pap test shows a typical scammer cell that is ascus. Or a, or an HCV test is performed on exam a sample collected at the same time. The cytology has come up obtained typically using the same container, the same, same sample in the container. Both a PAP test and HPV testing are performed and sample collected. A co testing screening interval is five years, and primary HPV testing the screening interval is better in do it in three years if it is done alone. Then in a low resource setting, what should be when when they, we are not available, when there is no availability of complex jar or when there is we are not having a resource setting for uh, cervical smear, you can go for visual inspection methods. This this is a tool for low resource setting women who do not have access to cervical cytology and human papillomavirus testing. So you you are do, using acetic acid and lower sidin both have similar efficacy for the detection of cervical epinephritis or cervical cancer. So VI means visual inspection after acetic acid. You um, um, place a woman in the lithotic position and you apply acetic acid to the cervix and wait for one minute. And then you look for any characterized, opaque, dense, well-defined acetobite areas that touches coma pulmonary junction or are close to the external lobes or by the presence of a cervical lid that turns acetobite. 
So the absence of color, color change is negative test. So if there is no color change, uniform is that is a negative test. Acetic acid dehydrated cells so that the squamous cells with relatively large or dense nuclei, example, metaplastic cell, dysplastic cells, self-inked human papillomavirus, reflect light and therefore appear white. Blood vessels and columnar cells are not affected by acetobate. So acetobate areas are pathogenic, but they are pathognomic. So it, it should be looked into. So low grade lesions, they, they stain as dull white and faint borders. High grade lesions, densely white, sharp borders and uh, sharp borders. The advantages are it is done in a rose resource setting, so it is inexpensive, can be performed by health worker also. In, um, if the VI is positive, that is visual inspection after acetic acid positive, that is you are seeing acetobite areas, then refer the patient for colposcopy followed by biopsy and treatment. Immediate treatment is based upon the uh, visual inspection. Um, uh, visual inspection of acetic acid, that is screening and treatment. The VD means that is visual inspection after local side in application. Similar to uh, maybe, yeah, that is visual inspection after uh, acetic acid, you um, the place the patient in lithotin person and see the cervix and you paint it with or uh, paint with local side in, and then you wait for one minute and see the changes. Uh, positive test means it consists of pale yellow area against a dark background. Normally, uniform up, normally the normal cells will uptake um, will with the uptake, uh, will take this take up the stain within the cell. Normal cells are highly glycogen content contained con, con, uh, high high in concentrated glycogen. So they will take up iodine and become dark brown or mahogany brown. But pay, but abnormal cells. Now they are non glycogenated. There is rapidly multiplying cells. There is no glycogen storage is present. So there is um, so the uh, um, abnormal cells having no glycogen content. They will not take up the the mahogany and the glucose sodium. So they will be uh, appear as pale um, pale cells. There is appear as pale yellow. So no gly non glycogenous cells which are malignant and also normal columnar cells which are, which don't have glycogen and glandular cells will not take up iodine and remain light yellow or pale yellow. Normal cells will appear as mahogany brown. So areas of abnormalities and grow cervical lesions should be biopsy should be biopsy if possible during pap, pap testing early lesion that is raised tribal or has the appearance of condyloma should be biopsy biopsy. And regardless of previous cytology uh, or other risk factors for cervical cancer. So uh, the, after doing uh, the, the, all the screening test, if you are having a doubt or if you are having any uh, visual inspection after doing, uh, having the, done the visual inspection and really, and you are having doubt or yeah, it is not satisfactory or you are suspicious of lesion or on, the, on your uh, visual inspection itself, the cervix is unhealthy, you can post the patient for a colposcopy. This is a diagnostic procedure in which a colposcope, a dissecting microscope with various magnification lenses is used. To provide an illuminated, this provides an illuminated magnified view of cervix, vagina, and also the anus. The primary goal is to identify precancerous and cancer lesions so that they may be treated early and we can prevent full blown malignancy. The so corpuscopic evaluation is based on the finding that malignant and pre malignant epithelial cells have a specific visual characteristic in terms of contour, color, and vascular pattern and arranged uh, and they are recognizable using colpo and are recognizable using colposcopy. Distinguish normal and from abnormal areas and obtain direct biopsy. You can distinguish that is, you know, you can see the um, uh, you can um, uh, visualize the cervix by um, the magnification and you can see, distinguish a normal area from the abnormal areas and you can get that. You can do directed biopsies, not a blind biopsy. The users use used as a follow-up test to evaluate abnormal cervical cancer screening test. Uh, for abnormal um, that is evaluate abnormal screening uh, abnormal screening cancer screening test. That is in the cytology or a human papillomavirus is positive, HPV is positive, BI is positive, VLE is positive. You have to evaluate with colposcopy. An old gross examination of the cervix, vagina, or, vagina or vulva. There's any abnormal, gross abnormal, you can inspect with colposcope because it will get a magnified view. Evaluation of a palpably or visually abnormal cervix and vagina, direct taking direct biopsy, and also it is a help in localization of the lesion. The extent of the lesion can be localized much more uh, better, uh, much more clearly by the colposcope. Helps in may, may, helping helps in a distinguishing, differentiating a diagnosis or abnormal areas. Guiding a ability and excision procedures. 
the how we have to go about procedure the patient patient is put in a lithotomy position dorsal lithotomy position place a colposcope one feet from the vulva vulva uh, visualize the vulva for inhalations insert the speculum uh, and inspect the vagina cervix for inhalations focus on cervix initially with low power and offer overall visualization then high power for close visualization of lesions after looking at high power we can grow go, go in for grow green filter green filter effect that is uh, when you put on the green filter you can see any abnormal vasculature then clean the with saline remove the mucus and note findings and you can record also and apply 3% acetic acid first note the findings then go for lower side an application and then note the findings perform guided biopsy if indicated at the same setting lesion should be looked or um, looked into our erosion ulceration condylomata leukoplakia pigmented lesions exophytic lesions any suspicious lesion you can look and you can go for biopsy green filter or blue filter used to identify abnormal vasculature that is done after before applying uh, uh, acetic acid lower side So, what are the abnormal abnormalities you can find out in a cervical colposcopy? This includes osteoid epithelium and abnormal vascular patterns. Abnormal vascular patterns include punctured mosaic vessels in a field of osteoid epithelium in the transformation zone or suggestive of low-grade high-grade lesions. They are which are they are suggestive of low-grade high-grade lesions. That is muscular abnormalities. The typical vessels may appear as they have increased caliber they will so there is a increase there is increased pointlessness display irregular and abrupt changes in the direction they are widely spaced suddenly terminate or have a coarse screw or comma shape or hairpin patterns are they, they these all are suggestive of micro invasive or invasive disease so here the this is a colposcopic view of unhealthy cervix here you can see the ridge sign in mosaicism after the application of acetic acid there you can see the red inflamed areas So this is a picture of a low grade disease that is a thin acetoid areas areas in the epithelium irregular geographic borders fine and mosaic fine and fine punctation the cn2 this a, there is a dense acetoid area epithelium rapid appearance of acetoid in soft crypt and of that is a gland opening and coarse and mosaic coarse pattern sharp border inner border margin which these are all And the descriptions of a abnormal areas. This are these. If you if see any coarse mosaic, coarse punctation, sharp borders, inner border sign, ridge sign, everything is indicative or that uh, is diagnostic of CA two, CA interrupted two or three. So we can see here. You can see the interrupted neoplasia grade three. There is here is a typical blood vessels, the cobblestone or the mosaic pattern. So uh, this is a such as invasive cancer. The atypic vessels you can see: fragile vessels, irregular surface, exophytic lesions, necrosis, ulceration, and tumor and gross neoplasm can be seen. You can see the long vessels with dilation and tarrowing, surface vessels at obtuse angles, and irregular mosaic acetoid epithelium. So the complications of uh, colposcopy. This include bleeding or infection at the biopsy site. Effectiveness: the, effect the colposcopy is diagnosed as used to for as a follow-up and for women with abnormal cytology, and it can be done done as a um, it can be also used for uh, biopsy also. It has not been found to be effective screening for scan for cervical cancer when used or not. And but that is we have to combine for us to use it as a combination with screening, HPV testing, uh, cervical um, smear test testing, um, uh, HPV testing, and then then you go for. Um, this uh, colposcope. The treatment pattern of uh, CAN. Um, we can use. You can do either excision or ablation in that under transformation of the transformation zone of the cervix. Perform. It is. It can be performed as a OP setting and associated with low morbidity. The treatment of preinterval lesions include that local restrictive surgeries, their cauterization, cryo surgery, laser ablation, or local excision, which include cauterization with knife, laser, uh, large loop excision. Or the large, um, that is large um, loop excision of the endocervical and the loop excision or uh, loop electrical excision procedures also. Then radical excision like radical procedures like spiculectomy, extractomy. The excision pro excision procedures provide a diagnostic specimen which is have a specific advantage. But but the ablative procedures will not give a um, uh, specimen. So uh, just better excision procedure better compared to in the in, in view of uh, getting a specimen. So no evidence that 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 either ablation or excision is more effective. 
the choice of a procedure though if depending upon the primarily upon whether a diagnostic diagnosis uh, uh, a diagnosis specimen is needed or no, or on a future reproductive risk risk of adverse effects cost and convenience that is depending upon the risk depending upon the risk of adverse effects risk of uh, future pregnancy risk of um, uh, then the cost and convenience these are the uh, primarily the deciding factors when you choose regard between a excision or a excision or ablation Ablative procedures use an energy source. We do normally use energy source that requires a repair laser and destroy the transformation zone. This OP space under local anesthesia specimen not available for histology, enter lesion and transformation should, should be uh, treated. An excision to enter or endo cervix should be uh, excision to enter cervix should be um, less than 1.3 cm. So the larger lesions, with this, if the depth is more, you cannot uh, go for ablative procedures. Prior histological diagnosis required, you should have a, should have, that is, this is not an invasive malignancy. Confirm it is only, it is not an invasive malignancy. So uh, regarding cryotherapy, cryotherapy destroys destroy surface epithelium of the cervix by crystallizing the intracellular water resulting in the eventual uh, destruction of the cell. So the temperature needed to effect a destruction is minus 18 to 30 degrees, uh, 30 degrees Celsius. We commonly use nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide. So cryotherapy therapy should be considered acceptable therapy when the following criteria are met. There is CAN1 that has persisted for 24 months or CAN2 or there should be small lesions, endocervical location only, a negative endocervical sampling and no endocervical gland involvement on biopsy. That is ectocervical, sorry, ectocervical location. Only ectocervical palations can be got done for by cryotherapy or treated with cryotherapy. Where there is an extent in, extension into the endocervix, we have to go for other, other treatment modalities. This is the cryotherapy probes with various size tips. The, we have introduced this uh, tip into the external O's, into the O's, uh, and then we will apply um, freeze and thaw techniques is used. Three minutes of freezing, then five minutes of thawing. Depth of freezing is 5 mm. So the CAN within this 5 mm area is get destroyed. Through two uh, sequential freeze and thaw cycles are used. Success rate is around 95 percentage. It can be done as outpatient procedure. Disadvantage is mainly profuse vaginal discharge. It lasts for three to six, three to four years, for three to four weeks. Proceeding for coma color, proceeding as coma color junction into endocervical canal. So future inspection and future um, uh, future um, uh, screening becomes difficult. So follow up of which pap smear and for colposcopy every four to six months. Another abla ablative procedure available is laser ablation using carbon dioxide laser. And their lesion should be vis uh, visible. And depth of destruction is around five to seven millimeter ectosory. So the lesion should be within this um, uh, depth and uh, eight, 8 to 9 mm around the endoservix. Advantages are suitable large irregular lesions, success rate is around 95%, no troublesome vaginal discharge, and disadvantage it is very expensive, need special training. Thermoablation we use electrocautery. Um, the entire transformation zone, including the lesion, is cauterized. Depth of cauterization is around 5 to 7 mm. Disadvantages that is quick and old, similar to um, that, that is uh, cold uh, cryotherapy, that, that is profuse vaginal discharge. And then recurrence rate slightly higher and notice not, no, not uh, commonly used now. Excessional procedures cone, cone biopsies or cervical condensation can be done. Consist of the removal of cone shaped sickness specimen that includes the transformation zone and the portion of the endocervix. The cold line colonization that is performed with normal scalpel has been la largely replaced by leaf, also closed, called as large group excision of transformation zone. Laser colonization is another technique. Advantages, specimen is available for histology. All the, uh, the, all the external procedures will give you a specimen for, for future examination and, uh, and, uh, and for, uh, record, uh, for record. Type of ex excision. The excision can be three types. Type 1, only the uh, completely uh, the ectocervical excision. Type 2, includes small amount of ectocervical, endocervical epithelium. Type 3, includes large, lar longer and larger cone-shaped tissue. Significant amount of endocervical epithelium is also removed. So what is, uh, that is loop electrical excision procedures, also called as large loop excision of transformation. So the treatment of choice in most CIN 2 and 3, now has now replaced ablative procedures using wire loop water. You can see that different shapes of wire loop water are available. Depending upon the lesion, you choose the wire loop. It can be small. In the picture, you can see different shapes. So you can choose according to lesion and you excise um, the, the lesion by this specific wire loop so that you can give a complete clear of the clear. You can give a clear, you can get a clear margins. 
so it is easy to learn procedure is always based under local anesthesia after localization with colposcopy with the appropriate loop specimen taken and sent for histopathological examination this is the um, uh, logarithm or this is a uh, picture of the um, uh, there is a um, loop like leap instrument the cold knife condensation means you are excis you are excising the cone shaped specimen from the cervix the base of the cone is at the ecto cervix and apex at the ecto cervical canal and a cone shaped specimen is excised so that uh, this should be avoided in early paris women who um, because of um, uh, it may affect future infertility so indications are mainly lesions extending into endocervical canal histologic diagnosis of um, adenom adenocarcinoma in situ recurrent um, abnormal glandular cell cytology cytology histology discordance and suspect microinvasive cancers skip lesions in the endocervical canal recurrent high grade lesions and large lesion which are more in which involves more than 50% of cervix involvement the procedure under spinal general anesthesia visualization with colposcopy apply dugal side in excision of the cone using a scalpel or knife cauterize the bleeding points keep hemostatic packet in the vagina so you can see using a scalpel in including the base is at the level of the internal external os and the apex at the level of the internal os that is at the level of internal os here you excise a comb shaped cone shaped area which in which includes the transformation so the complications are mainly hemorrhage infection cervical stenosis cervical incompetence recurrent preterm preterm labor and preterm labor and recurrent pregnancy loss laser colonization includes using carbon dioxide laser in indications procedure complicates similar to cold knife colonization very expensive we need very, very much expertise so now um, uh, we have discussed uh, regarding the treatment man management protocols of uh, treatment options we will discuss the management women in cn1 first uh, uh, cn1 and 2 and 3 like that cn1 with prio cytology sample report as atypical squamous cells of undetermined, undetermined significance that ascus or low grade squamous intraepithelial lesions uh, slsil or normal cytology in the presence of human papillomavirus 6 and 18 recommended follow up is co testing with site of site uh, cytological examination and hpv test at one year so women with cn1 and a preceding cytolo cytological test of high grade squamous intraepithelial that is hsil or a squamous uh, or abnormal squamous cells cannot rule out hsil that is acsh either an excision procedure or observation with col col colposcope at 12 months and 24 months are recommended so we have to go it's better in a low reserve setting or when the if the patient is will not go we are sure that the patient will not come for follow up then it is a excision procedure is must is best the patient is very well compliant then you can go for a follow up women with cn1 that persists for last 2 years continue follow up for or may you can under may or undergo treatment if the under if the patient is not uh, willing for follow up if the for, for women c and one who undergo treatment we have to um, uh, go for rather um, go for uh, leap rather than colonization because it is better leap doing we leap, leap because it is less destructive and less uh, hospital stay so management of women c and 2 and 3 c and 2 and 3 the most women with cn2 and 3 with an adequate colposcope treatment excision rather than ablation is uh, ablation is preferred because you will you have to examine the margins of the excised uh, portion excised uh, may, uh, excised tissue so that you can see whether there is it is completely excised or there is remaining inside the cervix uh, leap is performed over cold cold knife colonization for women with cn2 and 3 with adequate inadequate colposcopy recurrent cn2 or 3 or intracellular sampling cn2 and the excision is better than ablation for women with cn2 and 3 an adequate colposcopy observation of treatment is acceptable if the patient is very willing for follow up and it is it may be uh, treatment may be co um, costly so in cn2 and 3 it is better go for excisional uh, biopsy excisional biopsy excision and see whether the margins are clear and what the men see whether it is cn2 or 3 or whether there is any in the uh, uh, c in cervical intraepithelial carcinoma in situ so future obstetric risk excision has been associated with the increased risk of adverse obstetric outcomes 
second trimester pregnancy loss premature labor um, premature labor premature rupture of membranes and preterm labor so leap is performed uh, preferred excisional by preferred excisional by third used um, because it is it can be used associated with low risk uh, lower low risk of preterm delivery in cold, rather than cold life condensation so leap is the preferred excisional method um, because it has got lesser uh, complications So the excisional procedures uh, having greater morbidity compared to ablative therapy, efficacy uh, efficacy rate of both ablation and excision appro uh, approximately 95 percent. The, the the differentiating factor is that you can have a, a specimen and you can go have a histopathology. You can have a, um, a, a record that you have had what we have done for this patient. So hysterectomy, there is not a first line of my treatment of CAM, but it can be considered the treatment of, our, of the last resort of Ekrican high grade lesions. That is, and the patient who is not bidding her follow up. The so, preserves in women with CAM 2 and 3 with aspositive condensation margins have completed cell bearing and who would benefit from definitive procedure. Uh, for women with a histologic diagnosis of recurrent persistent CAM 2 or 3, may be necessary in a woman with scarring or shortening of cervix. Uh, prior to treatment that is prohibits or which we are not we are there is difficulty in repeat excision procedures and follow up preferable for women who are not willing or able to comply with follow up and also in patient adenocarcinoma in situ the, in these patients you this role also in the low resource setting or the patient is already family completed and it is above 40 years and you are giving seeing a high grade see a high grade lesion then it is bacon also opt for hysterectomy in our setting so outcome the cervical treatments, excision or ability can reduce risk of cancer of, of, of the cervix around 95 percent in the first eight years. And most failures occur in within two years, but occurrence may occur in um, the last uh, up to 10, 20 years. The risk of invasive cervical cancer among these women um, remains uh, remains than the among the general population. That is, the risk of invasive cervical cancer among these women remains high compared to the normal general population. The increased risk persists for long, as long as 20 to 25 years. The prognosis after treatment, that is based upon presence of CAN, margin CAN, and margins of colonization, APR CAN, 3, 2, or 3, presence of CAN, 2, or 3, and margins of the colonization epithelium. But the um, uh, but a margin status is unknown following the ability therapy. So if the prognosis minimus depends upon the um, initial lesion and the margins of colonization. The positive margins means a significant high risk for residual disease. A human papillomavirus status following treatment also uh, appears to predict the risk of recurrence. The follow-up treatment management protocols are human papillomavirus or cervical cytology coexisting at 12 and 24 months. At 20, 12 and 24 months, if both the co test are negative, co testing should be repeated in three years. If the co testing is again is negative, the patient may resume routine screening. If there is abnormal cytology or positive HPV testing during the follow-up, colposcopy with endoservice cytolim should be performed again. Routine screening is recommended for last 20 years, even uh, the screen continues to, uh, even the, the, the scan, uh, even the patient continue, uh, the screening continues beyond 60 days. That is, routine screening is recommended for last 20 years, even the age of the patient continues beyond uh, 60 days. If CIN 2 and 3 identified at the margins of, of an excisional procedure and prospecies endosubject were attached, either repeat excision or hysterectomy may, may be per performed. Those, uh, that is, repeated or recurrent lesions, it's high grade lesions, is better to go family completed, better to go for hysterectomy. This is a comparison of the different treatment uh, managed protocols available. Mm, and you can see that. Uh, uh, commonly we perform uh, better or uh, commonly recommended procedures uh, loop, loop that is uh, excision procedures is leap how will you prevent the prevention is mainly by using condoms and dietary changes and behavioral changes and human human papillomavirus is fact is the primary prevention that, that that aims at the primary prevention that is you can have bivalent vaccine quadrivalent vaccine and non-valent vaccine it protects uh, against HV infection, genital warts, and cervical carcinoma. Duration of action is around 5 to 6 years. Protection up to 10 years. This nano variant is preferable, preferred if it is available. So types of human papillomavaccine, you can see that bivalent vaccine, quadrivalent vaccine, and nanovalent vaccine are available, which include 16, 18, 6, 11, 31, 33, 45, 52, and 68. 
So the administration, routine vaccination, 9 to 13 years of age of the girls, um, girls and boys, and catch-up vaccination, 13 to 26 years. Schedule, if there is than 15 years of age, 2 dose at 0 and 6, 0, 6 and uh, 2 to 0, 6 and 12 months. And if it's six, six and, between 6 and 12 months, you can take to only 2 doses. And more than 15 years, 3 doses, 0, 1, 2 and 6 months. Immunocompromise, 0, 1, 2 and 6 months, regardless of age. Then the dose is 0.5 ml IM. Thank you. Do you have any doubts? If you're having any doubts, you can ask. No doubts? Then we will wind up the session. You know, now.
गुड मॉर्निंग Good morning. I am Dr. Purnima from Department of Pediatrics. Today we will learn about nephrotic syndrome. The learning objectives are how to define nephrotic syndrome, how we can classify the etiology according to etiology and pathophysiology of nephrotic syndrome, the clinical features, investigations, treatment and follow up and the complications of nephrotic syndrome. These are the things we are going to learn today. By definition, nephrotic syndrome is a glomerular disorder characterized by massive proteinuria, hypoalbuminemia, hypercholesterolemia, with or without edema. Of these, proteinuria is the first thing to happen. Following that, the patient develops hypoalbuminemia, hypercholesterolemia, and edema. The incidence of uh, a nephrotic syndrome is 1 to 3 cases per 1 lakh children below 16 years of age etiological classification nephrotic syndrome can be either primary secondary or congenital of the total cases primary constitutes 90 percentage of the cases of total nephrotic syndrome of this minimal change in nephrotic syndrome is the commonest that is 85 percentage Others are focal segmented glomerulosclerosis, membrane of proliferative glomerulonephritis, membranous glomerulonephritis. These are the idiopathic or primary nephrotic syndrome where there is no cause is found out for the nephrotic syndrome. Secondary means there is some cause for the nephrotic syndrome like connective tissue disorders, SLE, Hinoxolin, Purpura, infections like hepatitis b hepatitis c malaria hiv syphilis etc miscellaneous causes like drugs penicillin gold nsaids malignancies like leukemia lymphoma b sting genetic and congenital nephrotic syndrome you can find in a in an infant less than 3 month of age it can be either a primary one or a secondary one primary means there is no cause for the congenital nephrotic syndrome and secondary means there is some cause like intrauterine infections toxins etc so today we will discuss mainly about the minimal change nephrotic syndrome which is the commonest one which constitute 85 percentage of the primary nephrotic syndrome the pathology you can see the nephron bowman's capsule etc and uh, on the right it is the filtering barrier glomerular filtering barrier which is constituted by the endothelium of the capillaries base membrane and the food processes of the podocytes these three things constitute the filtering membrane of the glomerulus or filtering barrier of the glomerulus 
here in nephrotic syndrome, you can say, see the podocytes here on the right cell body and the food processes. And in between, there are slit diaphragm through which the filtrate are going to the urinary space. In the right, you can see the effaced podocytes. Effaced podocytes means they are shortened, shrinked. In nephrotic syndrome, you can see the change in podocytes. Podocytes are actually modified epithelial cells which play a major role in the filtration of protein. In nephrotic syndrome, minimal change in nephrotic syndrome, the major change you are seeing here is the effacement of podocytes and the food processes. And what is the pathology of pathophysiology of edema? When there is increased glomerular permeability to albumin, there is albuminuria, which can in turn result in hypoalbuminemia and decreased plasma oncotic pressure. Decreased plasma oncotic pressure leads to movement of water from the intravascular space to the interstitium, which can lead to edema. And when there is a movement of water from the intravascular space, there will be hypovolemia. Hypovolemia can lead to increased production of renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, and there will be renal water and sodium retention. This causes increased fluid load in the intravascular space, and which can also increase the pressure and movement of water from the intravascular space to the interstitium. And also hypovolemia can lead to non-osmotic ADH release, which, which in turn result in salt and water retention. These are the main mechanisms for edema in nephrotic syndrome. First of all, one is hypoalbuminemia albuminemia leading to decreased oncotic pressure, which in turn leads to movement of water from the intravascular space to the interstitium. Another mechanism is increased renin angiotensin aldosterone system, which causes renal water and sodium retention. The third one is increased ADH release due to the decreased urinary output. So which can also result in salt and water retention. Another mechanism that is uh, that is being described is the primary renal sodium retention in the distal tubules, which causes increased blood volume, increased blood pressure, which is altering the Stirling's forces and causing edema. That is called the overfill theory. The other one is underfill theory. And uh, another component of nephrotic syndrome, apart from hypoalbuminemia, is hyperlipidemia. This is as a result of increased synthesis of, of protein in the liver and decreased uh, catabolism of lipids. And of this cholesterol, LDL, VLDL are increased and HDL is almost normal. The clinical features, usual age group for minimal change. We are mainly discussing about the minimal change in nephrotic syndrome. The age group is two to six years. It is of insidious onset. Edema initially appears on the periorbital region, then to the legs. That is called pedal edema, then to the abdominal wall, then generalized edema appears that you can call as anasarca. And when there is edema, there will be oliguria because of the shift of fluid from the intravascular space to the uh, interstitial tissue there will be hypovolemia, which result in oliguria. The male sex predominance is there. Male is to female ratio is two is to one. You can see the periorbital edema in the picture. You can see the pedal edema, vulval, penile, scrotal edema, generalized edema. That is called the anasarca. You can see the pitting pedal edema, you can look, you can press over the above the medial malleolus for 30 seconds. Not on the medial malleolus, above the medial malleolus on the shin for 30 seconds. 
and you can see the indentations. And the uh, other picture, you can see the distended abdomen due to the fluid filled inside the abdomen due to ascites. Clinical features are mainly edema, that is pitting, bilateral pedal edema is there, it will be there, sacral edema, periorbital edema, scrotal edema, abdominal wall edema, ascites and pleural effusion. These are the, this is the main feature if it is only a simple minimal change in nephrotic syndrome. These are the atypical features seen in some cases of nephrotic syndrome, gross hematuria, hypertension, steroid resistance, joint involvement, skin rashes, renal failure, age less than one year and more than 10 years. Then you can think, if these features are present, you can think it is not minimal change in nephrotic syndrome. It is other than minimal change in nephrotic syndrome or it can be a secondary nephrotic syndrome, like SLE, you can see the skin rashes, uh, joint involvement, etc., hypertension, etc. The complications that usually you can see is massive edema. Uh, as we have discussed, it is, you can call it as an asarca. And infections, like most common infection is peritonitis, the less common ones are cellulitis, pneumonia, UTI, and sepsis. And the second complication is thromboembolism. And the third one, you can, uh, uh, certain patients, you can experience hypotension and shock. Hypotension and shock is due to the extravasation of intravascular, uh, intravascular fluid into the ex extravascular space, which can lead to hypovolemia which leading to hypotension, growth failure, and steroid toxicity. Growth failure can also uh, result as a result of chronic steroid usage. Causes of infection in nephrotic syndrome are urinary loss of immunoglobulin, that is mainly IgG, and the complements mainly C3 and C5 and impaired opsonization of microorganisms. That is why the children with uh, nephrotic syndrome are getting prone to more of infection and the edema fluid also act as a good culture media for infection. Commonest infection seen in nephrotic syndrome is peritonitis caused by pneumococci and gram negative organism. Clinical features of peritonitis are fever, abdominal pain, and peritoneal signs like tenderness, guarding, rigidity, etc. You can see cellulitis, fatness, swelling, etc. on the leg. And the causes of thromboembolism, there is a hypercoagulable state of blood due to volume depletion. There is increased hepatic production of fibrinogen and there will be urinary loss of antithrombic factors such as antithrombin 3, protein S, and protein C. These are the causes of thrombo thromboembolism in nephrotic syndrome. And common sites of uh, thromboembolism are cerebral venous sinus, renal vein, and pulmonary vein. You can see in this picture the asymmetry of the lower limbs. You can see the right limb is swollen due to the deep vein thrombosis. Cerebrovenous thrombosis causes right hemiparesis in a small child. Steroid toxicity mainly are growth failure. There will be short stature, pushing oil features like buffalo hum, striae, obesity, etc. will be there. Hypertension is usually seen with the chronic use of steroids and cataract. So in a patient with uh, nephrotic syndrome, when you are using steroids for a long time, you have to monitor the growth. You have to uh, measure the blood pressure. You have to see the 
eyes whether there is any cataract or not diagnosis mainly these are the four components of nephrotic syndrome urinary albumin will be three plus or more and total urine 24 hours is more than 3.5 grams per day and serum albumin accordingly will be decreased and it is less than 2.5 gram per deciliter and serum cholesterol is more than 200 mg per deciliter and along with that there will be edema initially when this loss of you, um, albumin in the urine which lead, which is leading to decrease serum albumin and edema and increase serum cholesterol in the blood investigations are done to confirm your diagnosis hematology first of all you have to do hemoglobin wbc count differential total count and differential count you want to rule out infections and hemoglobin to rule out anemia urine is the main stay of investigation uh, to find out nephrotic syndrome urine protein to detect uh, proteinuria and microscopy culture and sensitivity to see whether there is any urinary tract infection biochemistry you can do blood urea and serum creatinine to see whether the renal function is normal and also you can do the electrolytes whether there is hyponatremia uh, hyperkalemia etc and serum cholesterol whether it is increased or not to detect hypercholesterolemia X-ray test and Mando test are done to rule out tuberculosis because you are treating the patient with steroids. So you have to rule out tuberculosis before you start steroids. So the urine examination is the first thing you have to do when you suspect nephrotic syndrome. When you see a patient in the OP with the suspecting nephrotic syndrome, first investigation you want to do is urine examination for protein this are, there are three methods heat and acetic acid test dipstick and sulfosalicylic acid test these all are semi quantitative test you can detect it uh, if it is more than 3 plus or 4 plus it is almost sure that it is nephrotic syndrome 24 hour urine albumin estimation is the quantitative test you can see the 24 hour excretion of protein normal is 150 milligram per 24 hours if it is more than 3.5 gram per 24 hours it is suggestive of nephrotic syndrome and another test that you can do in the urine is protein creatinine ratio and usually it is 0.2 to 0.5 if it is more than 2 it is suggestive of nephrotic syndrome so you can uh, examine the urine mainly for urine albumin by heat and acetic acid test that you all know and using dipstick and using sulfosalicylic acid test if it is 3 plus or 4 plus it is suggestive of nephrotic syndrome and quantitative test is 24 hour urine albumin estimation you can collect 24 hour urine and do urine albumin estimation in a small sample and multiply with the total volume and if it is more than 3.5, means it is nephrotic syndrome. Another test is protein creatinine ratio, which is more than two is suggestive of nephrotic syndrome. Other tests that can do in the urine is urine microscopy, whether an urine culture and sensitivity, whether there is any puzzles or not. And you can, if there is puzzles, you can do culture and sensitivity to find out whether there is any urinary tract infection which these children are more prone to. And the most important thing that you have to keep in mind is you have to find out any infection in the patient because treatment of infection is important that because the treatment is mainly by the steroids. If you are treating the patient with the steroids, these infections can flare up and the patient will not respond to steroids. Can see the dipstick and the picture 
and if it is a trace means 15 to 30 milligram per deciliter 1 plus is 30 to 100 milligram per deciliter 2 plus 100 to 300 milligram per deciliter 3 plus is 300 to 1000 milligram per deciliter 4 plus is more than 1000 milligram per deciliter 3 plus and 4 plus is suggestive of uh, nephrotic syndrome if there are atypical features you can think of other than minimal change in nephrotic syndrome you have to do serum complement c3 it will be decreased ana will be positive dsdna uh, diseases like sle these three will be uh, ana will be positive D dsdna positive and serum complement will be decreased and uh, depending upon the cl clinical signs you can do the proper investigations so sbhg can be done if you are suspecting suspecting hepatitis b infection hiv you can do the test and depending upon the disease uh, you can do the investigations in uh, to see uh, in secondary nephrotic syndrome you have to find out the primary cause in secondary nephrotic syndrome the main stay of treatment is mainly the treatment of the cause not steroids renal biopsy is done in atypical congenital and steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome so if there are atypical features only you have to do this test otherwise urine uh, by uh, urine uh, albumin biochemistry is enough to treat the nephrotic syndrome treatment first of all you have to confirm the diagnosis and you have to uh, see whether it is a typical nephrotic syndrome or any atypical features are present you have to rule out infection before you start in uh, treatment rule out tuberculosis rule out complications and educate the parents and child if there is no infection no tuberculosis you can uh, start treatment first treatment is supportive management the second one is specific management supportive management are monitoring of the child admitted in the ward and if there is severe edema you can treat the edema and if there are complications you can treat the complication you have to give certain vaccinations and proper nutrition to the baby specific treatment for nephrotic syndrome minimal changes corticosteroids monitoring of a patient with a nephrotic syndrome in the ward or daily weight chart if the weight is increasing means the edema fluid is accumulating in the body so you have to uh, decrease the fluid intake daily bp recording has to be done whether the child is going to hypotension or whether the child is developing hypertension salt restricted diet mainly if the child is having severe edema maintain an input and output chart the use of input output chart is we have to give fluid according to the output only if you are giving more of fluid there is more chance of getting uh, severe edema in that patient diet normal calories since there is hyperlipidemia you have to restrict the fat less than 30 percentage of the calories and salt restriction if the if the child is edematous and the treatment of edema corticosteroids itself is a diuretic and if there is severe edema you can give diuretics mainly the loop diuretics frusamide and if it is not controlled by frusamide you can give albumin infusion vaccination no live vaccines are given during this steroid therapy or during the nephrotic syndrome state because it is a immunosuppressive state which can flare up the infection you can give pneumococcal and h influenza vaccine when the child is in relapse corticosteroids 
is the mainstay of treatment in nephrotic syndrome. The dose is 2 mg per kg, 24 hours, once a day for 6 weeks. Then you can change the dose to 1.5 mg per kg on alternate days, once a day for 6 weeks. And then taper off the dose. You cannot stop it suddenly. You can taper and stop. If there is a lapse, the treatment differs slightly. Prednisolone dose is 2 mg per kg, 24 hours, once a day, till remission, till the urine albumin is nil. Then you can change over to 1.5 mg per kg alternate days, once a day for four weeks. Then taper off and stop. Treatment, if there is complications, you can treat along with the steroids. Like if you are suspecting peritonitis, pneumonia, UTI, etc. Usually it, it will be pneumococci or gram negative organisms. So you can choose third generation cephalosporins. Infections you can treat with third generation cephalosporins mainly cefotaxim or ceftriaxone. And uh, you can treat edema with diuretics, mainly loop diuretics like frusamide, one to two milligram per kg. And if the edema is not subsiding with the frusamide, albumin infusion can be given, 25% albumin, 0. 0.5 to 1 gram per kg, followed by intravenous frusamide. Because there will be influx of all the fluid, edema fluid inside the uh, vessels, which can cause, cause hypertension, heart failure, etc. So we have to give intravenous frusamide when we are giving when you are giving 25 percentage albumin and if there is thrombosis you can give anticoagulant therapy like heparin low molecular weight heparin warfarin etc and there are certain definitions uh, following um, uh, treatment what is relapse relapse is urine albumin three plus or more in early morning sample for three consecutive days. That is relapse. Remission means urine albumin nil or trace for three consecutive days. Steroid sensitive nephrotic syndrome is remission after stoppage of steroids. That is the child is urine albumin free for three days. Steroid dependent nephrotic syndrome means relapse during alternate day steroids or within two weeks of stopping steroids. So the patient is dependent on steroids. When you change the dose or stop the dose, the, there is relapse. Steroid resistant nephrotic syndrome means no remission even after four weeks of steroid therapy. So steroid sensitive means complete cure after steroid treatment. Steroid dependent means after stoppage or decrease in the dose of steroids causes relapse. Steroid resistant means there is no remission, no cure after four weeks of steroid therapy. Other medication that can be used in steroid dependent resistant patients are if the child is not responding to steroids, other options are cyclophosphamide, chlorambucil, levamisole, cyclosporin, tacrolimus, etc. These are all given in steroid resistant and dependent cases. 
take home points nephrotic syndrome is the commonest glomerular disease in children it has a chronic clinical cause with recurrent episodes of edema nephrotic syndrome responding to steroid therapy has a good prognosis close follow up of, of the child and monitoring of side effects of immunosuppressants is very important in this children if you are giving steroids you have to follow up the children for the side effects or toxicity features if you are giving the immunosuppressant you have to look for the uh, side effects of that drugs so finally i'll give some exam questions you can see the questions describe clinical features and management of a child with first episode of nephrotic syndrome define steroid dependence and resistance enumerate the complications of nephrotic syndrome write short notes on steroid toxicity infections in nephrotic syndrome urine protein estimation differences between nephrit nephritis and nephrotic syndrome that you have to learn by yourself thank you doubts undam undam cheyakana any any doubts